tonight what I want to do, I want to share with you how to get the most out of an athletic experience. And I'm finding that we need to have all three parts, the athletes, the coaches, and the parents on the same page for that to happen, for that to happen. So first, let me talk to the youngsters, okay? And your parents can eavesdrop and so can the coaches. Talent is overrated. Talent is overrated. The most important question you have to ask yourself is, how hard are you willing to work to get what you want? My friend Pete over there and I were at the girls' finals in Tom's River on Saturday. And when we were walking out, there was a girl there, it was probably about five o'clock, overcast. She had two buckets of softballs and she had the balls on the tee. No one there. She had to retrieve everything that she hit. By herself, she was working out to make herself better. Now, I understand most of you are involved in lacrosse. What did you do on Saturday? Try and get up another level in one of the video games you play? Did you go out and do it on your own? Here's what the research tells us. The research tells us that it takes 10,000 hours to master anything. If you look at the best players in every single sport, you will find one thing they have in common. They are absolutely the hardest workers. The hardest workers. See, we have what is like um, this effect where we turn on a television at 7 o'clock and we think that these people just got there. If you watch SportsCenter, you'll see that these players, especially in the NBA, they start shooting at five o'clock. Seth Curry is shooting at five o'clock for an eight o'clock game. No one works harder than he does. That's why he's the best. A couple years ago, when LeBron James won his second MVP consecutively, and the uh, third, I'm sorry, after the third championship, they said to him, what are you going to do over the summer? Are you going to travel, kick back, and go places? He said, no, I'll probably take off about two weeks, and then I'll get back in the gym, because I have to work on my 15 to 18-foot jump shot, because I'm just not good at it. This is a guy that just won his third, M his third NBA championship his second consecutive NBA playoffs MVP and an MVP in the league. That's what he does. So I would say to you as a young athlete, what do you do? How hard are you willing to work to be successful at what you're doing? What do you do when you're not practicing? Are you improving your strength? Are you working on your agility? Are you going someplace where there's a, ball, a wall and you're throwing a ball against the wall? The wall is undefeated. And you're working on your stick handling. Are you working running through cones? Are you working with someone bumping up against you so you maintain possession? I mean, I know very little about lacrosse, which is pretty obvious to you right now by what I've said, but you can be working at it. How hard do you want to work to get what you want? I have recruited athletes for years. And there's a kind of athlete that I'm always looking for. Uh, working with Yogi for over the years, I certainly learned that the idea that it's never over till it's over. If you watched UConn play basketball this weekend, you found that out. And I want to show you a video. Mike, are you ready? I want to show you a video. This is the kind of athlete that I want to coach. Take a look. The 600 meter underway 
Heather Dornard in Minnesota finished second this fact a year ago. She was in lane four. And Dornan is probably going to be your favorite. She actually won the NCAA championships in 2006 in the 800, but she only won one Big Ten championship in the two years. Three laps in this event, 600 meters, three times around the 200-meter track here at the field house. What a bold move by Fallon. She's looking very confident, and the Penn State runner is just running amazing today. She did win her heat in the 400, but ended up taking fourth overall. That's Fawn Dorr moving into the lead, a sophomore from Penn State. Dornard in running second. Dornan last year scored 23 points for the Golden Gophers in their Big Ten Championship, so they're really relying on getting a lot of points from her this weekend, and she's just coming by Fawn Dorr now in the home stretch, heading into the bell lap. Dornan and falling down gets up quickly, but that's going to cost her. Lucky she wasn't injured. Her teammate just went to the front, though, so they may be able to recover from that. And Dornan is flying down the back she stretch. Is she catching is catching up. She is going to catch Fawn Dorr, and she may catch the leaders. Wow. But she's got Fawn. This is a gutsy effort by Dornan. That is amazing. <laughs> to, to fall in a 600, I mean, this is basically a sprint. I mean, this is an extended 400, basically. To, to fall with 200 meters to go and get up and That, that is, is the kind of athlete that all coaches want to coach. Someone who does not give up. Someone who gives 100% all of the time. That wasn't a coach motivating her. That wasn't a parent motivating her. That was something internal. What we call it is bounce back ability. What happens when things don't go your way? In every sport that you play, it's not going to be a perfect thing. There are going to be missed shots. The ball is going to come away. You're going to have a turnover. What are you going to do? What we like to call it is bounce back ability. I teach a course in sports psychology at Montclair State and we talk about bounce back ability that we look for in athletes. And I can tell you that major college recruiters, one of the things that they look at is body language. Body language. What happens if you make a mistake? Are you blaming somebody else? Are you complaining? Or do you just get right back up and get involved? So when we talk about bounce back ability, we're talking about somebody who, when things don't go their way, give us that kind of a bounce back. That kind of bounce back ability where it's still going because that's contagious. That's a contagious attitude. However, there are a lot of people who don't bring energy to something. They suck the energy out of things. And when things don't go their way, their shoulders go down, they pout. So their bounce back ability is like that. Not only do they get down, they stay down. I can tell you, and you're very young, and it's not even something to really consider yet, but as a coach recruiting a player, or as a coach wanting to have somebody on my team the last kid that I want on my team is somebody who blames the officials, blames somebody else on the other team, or when things are not going well, he just tanks it. That's the last thing that I want to see. I want to see people who have bounce back ability. I can tell you Bobby Hurley wrote a book on excellence in coaching. He's the coach of St. Anthony's basketball. In the book that he wrote, he talks that no one goes through life undefeated. No one goes through life undefeated. You might have a successful season, but you don't go through life undefeated. I'm sure that everybody, most of the adults in here, have a story where you have had to overcome obstacles in your life. 
And this is something that you would want for your children. So, I will get back to this later, but the most important thing that I can tell you as a parent is to make sure that you are empowering your youngster and not enabling your youngster. And I'll explain that in a little bit. For a coach, I want you to remember a couple of things. The key to whether or not you are successful as a coach is very simple on a youth level. Now, I talk to different audiences. I've talked to Division I athletes and colleges. But for this particular group, here's how you measure success. How many kids are playing this year who played last year? Okay, I'm asking for the coaches now. That's how you determine whether you are successful. True, somebody might find another interest, okay? But generally speaking, kids want to be able to compete with their friends and they want to have fun. There was a study done at Stanford University and they found, they asked questions of people who played the highest level of sports, Division I, all the way down to T-Ball. And they asked them, what is the one thing you don't like about sports? What's the one thing you don't like about sports? And 75% had the same answer. Now, I don't know any question you could ask 75% of this population and get the same answer. They all said the thing they liked least was the PGA. Not the Professional Golf Association, the post-game analysis. When the game is over, they dread that ride home in the car where their parents are asking questions that they can't answer. Why does the coach play Tommy instead of you? You know, Mom, I, I've had that same question, but he never tells me why. Why are you playing three people in rush on instead of four people in the attack. Again, brilliant idea, but the coach doesn't ask me my opinion. When a game is over, a kid wants to know one thing. Where are we going to eat? That's it. That's what they want to know. That's what they want to know. Where are we going to eat? So we have to stop telling them what they did and didn't do, what we liked or didn't like that the coach did. Here's the only thing we need to say to our kid after a game. I really like watching you play. I really like watching you play. That's it. Don't tell a kid whether they played the most or the least. I wish I could put this sign up in front of every single field. Your child's performance in athletics has nothing to do with you as a parent. Zero. If your kid is the best player, that doesn't make you the best parent. Sorry. If your child doesn't play a lot, that doesn't make you the worst parent. And that doesn't mean you have to go out and hire somebody professionally to tutor your child. If your child wants it, he or she will go out and work at it. If they don't, it's not going to happen. If mastery only comes from 10,000 hours and the kid doesn't want it, then mastery's not going to come. And we know it's a cycle. You do well, you like it. You like it, you practice more. You practice more, you get better. You get better, you like it more. You like it more, you practice. We know that's the cycle. If the kid doesn't want it, they're not going to put the time in. So all of us living vicariously through our children, or I know it's tough. I think being a parent is very difficult. Being a sports parent is nearly impossible. Nearly impossible. I get it. This spring, I'll go down to the athletic director's convention, and I'll be one of the keynote speakers. This is my fourth trip down there. I think they keep inviting me down there until I get it right. 
And one of the things I'm going to tell them is we have to stop treating parents like they're the enemies. We need to understand what it's like to be a sports parent. We need to understand that the pressure on parents getting kids into school when nothing has increased as exponentially as college tuition. When it costs $50,000 to go to Monmouth, okay? Four years, do the math. And if you have more than one child, do the math. So whenever somebody in an AAU program or a youth program says, you know, your kid is really special, of course your ears open up. And you think scholarship, scholarship, scholarship. These people don't give scholarships. Only college coaches give scholarships. In the appendix of my book, I put NCAA statistics. And the chances of getting a scholarship are so infinitesimal. It's a chase that we really shouldn't be involved in. Let me give you for instance. One million kids played football in the United States last year. One million. Of the one million who played football, 6% played in college. That's Division I, Division II, and Division III. 6%. Interestingly, there are one billion dollars in athletic scholarships. Now that sounds like a lot of money, a billion dollars. There's $22 billion available in academic scholarships. So maybe our kids need Spanish tutors instead of pitching coaches. So I want you to watch this video, and I want you to remember, you youngsters, when you're out there and things aren't going well for you, and you have a little pity party for yourself, just remember this young man. Evan, uh, yes. you're, you're incredible, you're amazing, you. and you started dancing when you were how old? I was five years old. Uh -huh. I saw my sister in a dance class, and I went to the studio to pick up my sister with mm -hmm. my mom, and I just thought, hey, this looks really cool and a lot of fun, so why not give it a shot? And the following year, I started tap dancing, and I really wanted to go further with that, and so I auditioned for a, pro a professional tap company called the New Jersey Tap Ensemble. Mm -hmm. And I got in and I started performing at places like Lincoln Center, the Schomburg Museum in Harlem, and the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. Wow. So, yeah. so mainly it was tap that you did? You did yeah. different kinds? Yes, yeah, so I was trained in all other forms of dance, tap, but jazz, tap. ballet, mainly tap. And it, 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 you were 18 when they figured something was wrong with your leg? What did you feel? I was, I was 19 and I uh, was in college and I felt this pain in my leg, and it, I thought it was just a fracture or a bruise on the, on the bone or something like that from mm -hmm. dancing. And I went to an orthopedic surgeon. He took an x-ray, and he said he didn't want to touch it because it looks like a tumor. And he said, go to uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering and have their orthopedic specialist check it out. And they performed a biopsy on me a couple days after, and I was told that I have osteosarcoma bone cancer which was devastating to be told as a tap dancer. <laughs> as, <laughs> Frightening. Yes, at any age, much less 19, as a dancer. Yeah. And then uh, they, how many surgeries, they tried to avoid amputation, right? Yes. What did, how many surgeries did you have first? I had 10 different surgeries first, and at that 10th one, I was in the OR, and my cancer had come back. And so now the only thing left to do was to amputate my right leg above the knee. Because it had spread to your lungs even, right? Yes, when it came back the second time, it was in the, the, um, the soft tissue uh -huh. as well as the bone, and there was a threat that it spread to my lungs, which in fact it did. Mm -hmm. So I had two lung surgeries. They took out about eight different tumors. Went through 16 months of chemotherapy, 
And shortly after my last dose of, ke of chemo, a week later, I was back up and I was tap dancing. Unbelievable. Thank you. Unbelievable. Thank you. We all need to hear stories like that, you know? It's because it, it just sometimes it just is so ridiculous. Life is, you know, the littlest thing, and, and right. we're like, oh, I, we're, this is tough. And then somebody like you comes along to remind us how amazing, uh, you know, the, you just go on. You just keep going and doing the things you love. And you're, exactly. you know, doing it in a different way now, but it's beautiful. All right, will you dance for us? Absolutely. All right, Evan. I will. All right. All right. I want to make this a special night for you. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you an opportunity to meet Evan Ruggiero. Evan, why don't you come out, buddy? Ladies and gentlemen, Evan Ruggiero. I just work here. So, can I, can I perform for them? You can do whatever you like, buddy. All right, sounds good. So, uh, as Coach McCarthy said, uh, I lost my right leg to osteosarcoma uh, when I was 19 years old. I went through 16 months of chemotherapy, and uh, two weeks after I finished chemo, I got a peg leg and I started tapping. So one of the, uh, one of the, the role models and uh, inspiration uh, to myself was a famous tap dancer named Peg Leg Bates. Has anyone heard of him? Maybe? No? All right, so I'll give you a little bit of history on him. So Peg Leg Bates was a tap dancer way back in the day, and he lost his leg in a cotton gin accident when he was 12 years old. And his uncle uh, came home and made him a peg leg out of a crutch. And so Peg Leg, just we call him Peg Leg, <laughs> Uh, he just went on to uh, start tap dancing, and uh, he was the opening act on the Ed Sullivan Show. Uh, he uh, performed on that 58 times. Uh, he performed for the Queen of England, the King of England, uh, all around great guy. And I saw a video of him when I was 16 years old, and uh, that was my uh, director of the uh, New Jersey Tap Ensemble who showed me that video. And I just thought, wow, this guy is a really cool guy. He's a great tap dancer. He's laying it down. He's doing steps that are better. You know, he could do it better with one leg than some people can with two legs. And little did I know then that, you know, I would be following in his footstep, as I say. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a joke. You know? <laughs> uh, so uh, the first peg leg that I had, which uh, you saw on the, on the video, um, uh, my prosthetist, someone who makes prosthetic legs, uh, just kind of went into his back room. I told him that I wanted to tap dance, and he kind of came back out with um, just a pipe, just a blue metal pylon. And uh, we just kind of went from there. And uh, now it's been six years since I lost my leg, and just recently, uh, in this past October, I had a new peg leg made for me that uh, is uh, supposed to pay homage to Peg Leg Bates. So here's the new creation. And uh, I've been traveling all around the country, performing, tap dancing, singing, uh, performing in musicals, and I'm um, just back to what I was uh, doing when I was in college, right before I lost my leg. So now I'll just, I'll perform for you, I'll tap for you, I'll sing a song for you.
No, no. I'm just an audience member. Thank you. I'm hoping that for you youngsters and for all of you who are here, that when you find some difficulty in your life, that you will remember Evan's story, and you will remember that there's always light at the end of the tunnel. Um, for you youngsters, how hard do you want to work to get what you want? You can see the work that this young man has um, put in, and uh, we're very proud of him as a graduate of um, Montclair State. Um, and he will be here, as I say, at the end. I wanna move along, uh, Ev, if you don't mind. I have another video to show. Right. I have another video to show uh, right. of another um, Montclair State grad, okay? So you'll hear more from Evan uh, when we finish. Um, <laughs> the one choice that you have to make, all of us have to make, is are we going to go all in or are we going to hold back? We asked this question of our students at Montclair State. How many of you are in school? They all raise their hands. Okay, how many of you are into school? Well, I don't know what that means. I'm not really that into it. Everything that we're involved in in life, whether it's our friendships, whether it's our marriage, whether it's our teaching profession, we get the most out of it if we are all into it. Now we had a young man several years back who was an all-American basketball player at Montclair State University. And uh, he became pretty famous for um, something that he invented. And it's a, it's a phrase now that is used everywhere, but I'm proud to say that this young man hails from Montclair State and he's the first one that came up with it, and if you're Giant fans, you'll probably remember this. All in. All in. All in. All in. All in. To understand how two words, all in, turned a New York Giants season going nowhere into a trip to the Super Bowl, you gotta go back to the night before Christmas Eve. The Giants were seven and seven, and they'd lost five of their last six. I think there's some empty graves out there that people were digging for the Giants. There was definitely something missing. That night at a player's chapel meeting. We had a young guy come in and speak. He delivered one of the most timely messages that I've had, uh, not only in my football career, but in my life. His name is John Paul Gonzalez, a ninth grade teacher and speaker in nearby Union City, New Jersey. He's friends with the Giants team chaplain who asked him to speak to the team. Were you nervous? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. I mean, you, you go in a room and you see, like, Eli Manning in the front row, and then you see Justin Tuck, and you see these guys, and you're like, wow. Gonzalez turned out not to be just a teacher of kids. He turned out to be a teacher of giants. He kind of put everything in, into two words all in. He gave everyone poker chips, had everyone put their initials on the poker chip, and advised us to keep it with us. When you have something that you feel can't be beat, you know, what do you do? You throw it all in. The next day, the Giants whipped the Jets 29 to 14. Hand off Bradshaw. He's gonna run right through a tackle. Touchdown, Giants. Afterwards, we was all in today. Um, went to chapel last night, and our speaker talked about all in. And today, you know, you could just tell the Giants were all in. And before you knew it, all in had worked its way all around the Giants' locker room. 
It's just some, something that became, you know, infectious. Wanting to give more effort, wanting to stay behind and watch more film. Ever since then, everybody, all 53 guys, 46 on game day, they're all in. The next week, they beat the Cowboys, punching their playoff ticket. The New York Giants are the NFC East champions. And then the chaplain again sent me a message and said, you wouldn't believe this, but they made towels for the game. It's not about uh, individual. It's just everybody being 100% dedicated to the team. Then they dismissed the Falcons at home in the first round of the playoffs. And a week later, they went into no less than Lambeau Field and shocked the 15-1 Packers. The New York Giants have eliminated the number one seed, Green Bay Packers. They're all in. The chip is a chip, but you know, it's our minds, you know, that are powerful. What's going to give you that extra edge? What's going to give you that extra push? And that's new since you since you dedicated yourself to all in. You know, I, I don't think I was giving it 100%. I might have been giving it 90%. But now I think, you know, for the last five weeks, I've been definitely giving it 100%. The 49ers in San Francisco, the NFC title game, jackpot. The Giants in overtime have won the NFC championship. All the way down, you know, to the custodians, to the cooks that we have here within the facility. And when I say all in, I, I really mean they're all in. You came up with it. <laughs> Doesn't that feel great? It does. It does. But I, I know it's a lot of tribute to their hard work. If you win this Super Bowl, what will you do with the chip? I'll probably frame that chip, you know, in all honesty and, and make sure I keep it by me, you know, at all times. I'll probably keep it next to my Super Bowl ring. Do you think you'll get a ring? <laughs> I wouldn't turn one down. <laughs> We're very, very proud of John Paul Gonzalez. So why don't we bring him out so you can meet him? John Paul Gonzalez. I'll put it on the second. Is okay. Excellent. Uh, it's a pleasure, honor to be here. Um, I'll explain the attire in a second. I know it's, a little, it's even a little uh, warm, but it's all right. I'll explain it. Uh, really quick before I start, um, any Giants fans here? Any Giants fans? Awesome, awesome. Oh, to be, to be fair, to be fair, you're right. Any Jets fans? Any Jets fans? Four, excellent. To my Jets fans, really quickly, I just want to let you know, um, good luck with that this year. Um, I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, but to my Giants fans, yeah, let me just drop this real quick. To my Giants fans, I just want you to know one thing. Um, I haven't spoken to the whole entire team for the past four years, so all the losing in between this Super Bowl is not my fault, okay? Just want you to know that. Um, actually, pretty excited this year. They actually hired me um, to be a part of the team this year. So pretty excited to be working with them. Hopefully we'll, uh, you know, every four years, I think we won a Super Bowl. We've done it since 2007. I think it's about that time. Anyone else? Yeah, about that time? I think so too. But honestly, the crazy thing is, this whole all-in thing is something I didn't expect. Something I didn't even think was possible. As you heard, uh, I'm not a football player. I'm a ninth grade world history teacher. That was my job when they called me up. See, I, I thought it was a joke. I thought it was a prank that the Giants would call me up to speak to their team. And I remember picking up the phone and thinking it was a joke and saying, all right, yeah, sure. And they said, no, this is actual the New York Giants. Will you, will you come speak to our team? It's funny how things work out, and I just want to talk, to talk to the students here for a second. See, the funny thing is in life, you think that your biggest opportunity is going to come when everybody's watching. That championship game, right? You know, on the biggest stage. It doesn't happen that way. See, the New York Giants called me. You know how they heard about me? From jail. You know, I saw some faces. I'm not personally from jail, okay? <laughs> saw some parents, concerned looks, no. I was tutoring kids in jail. And one of the kids happened to be related to someone who knew someone who worked for the Giants. And I tell him he needs to be committed to changing his life. And before I know it, he actually gets out because it was a misdemeanor. And he starts changing his life. And I get a call three years later from that night I was tutoring a 15-year-old kid in jail. Because I asked him, I said, how would you get my number? They said, well, you don't know about this, but um, you were doing some work in jail three years ago. We thought you'd be good to speak to the team. It's funny how things work out when you're not focused on being in the spotlight, you're just willing to do whatever it takes. See, maybe on your teams, guys, everyone wants to be in the spotlight. But maybe there's some guys that coach needs just to do whatever it takes, right? We don't think it's glamorous because maybe we're not the ones scoring the points. We're not the ones getting the, the newspaper article. 
because that's what life is. Like I said, this all-in thing is something I didn't expect. Because when I talked to the Giants, I remember I was scared. But I tried my best for 20 minutes, and after 20 minutes finished, I walked out and I thought I failed. So that's the second thing. Sometimes doing the right thing, you're not going to feel great afterwards. I would love to say, you do the right thing, you're going to feel amazing. You're not. Sometimes you think it was better if you didn't even try. Like sometimes when you make those decisions not to go along with everyone else and cheat on that test. Sometimes we make that decision to work hard and practice, even when coach is not there or watching. Sometimes you'll still get made fun of even though you do that. But the funny thing is when you do what's right, even if it's not popular, you do it for you. That's what all in is. Because when I spoke to the Giants, I didn't think anything was going to happen. Before I know it, they start winning games. And the next game, and the next game. And then I get these phone calls from this show called Fox and Friends in the morning in New York City to appear on the Fox News channel. And then I get this phone call to appear on this radio show you might have heard, it's called Boomer and Carton in the morning. And then I get this other phone call to appear on this radio show called Mike and Mike in the morning. And then the ESPN comes to my high school, they take that whole entire piece. And I remember they said, Mr. Gonzalez, if the Giants win the NFC Championship, we will play that Super Bowl Sunday in front of the world. Well, they won the NFC Championship. Now, like I said, I was a teacher. so. I could have went to the Super Bowl with the Giants, but as a teacher, I wanted to be there for my students the next day on Monday, like good teachers would. Actually, to be honest, as a teacher, I was out of sick days, but anyway, <laughs> teacher problems. I'm walking to school on the Monday, the Giants win the Super Bowl, I'm excited. I turn the corner to go into my building, there is news vans lined up down the block in front of my school. I'm a little nervous, but I keep walking. I go into the main office, I sign my name in the book, the principal comes up from behind me, he says, Mr. Gonzalez. I said, yes, sir. He said, I think we have a problem, follow me in the conference room. I go into the conference room, I open up the door, there's a reporter from CBS, NBC, ABC, even CNN Espanol is there, I don't even speak Spanish. We do interviews all morning long. The next day, I don't walk to school, I run. Because I figure, if that's the first day, who's going to be here today to interview me? I thought maybe a different cable station, maybe Oprah was going to give me a car, like I was excited. I run to school, it's nobody. Sometimes fame is just that quick. So I remember I, I go in and they say, oh, Mr. Gonzalez, there's a message left for you. Someone called earlier. I called the number back. They said, oh, we're having a victory parade in New York City. And you may have seen the parade the Giants had in New York City with all the ticker tape. It was awesome. They said, we'd love for you to join us. I said, sure. And I get there and they're giving out t-shirts to everybody. And there's two words on every single t-shirt that they're giving out. Now, I need, I need you guys to help me right there. What are these two words? Always. Okay, that was all right but I think we can do a little better. Even my Jets fan, imagine this is like green and white and like you guys won, okay? Let's, let's try this, ready? There we go, awesome, awesome. And it was amazing being with the Giants and the ticker tape is awesome. But you know, I go to school on Wednesday, there's no news cameras, no reporters. This time I actually make it up to my room, I open up my lesson plans, we're gonna learn about ancient Rome, Julius Caesar, all this good history stuff. The phone rings, I pick up the phone, the voice said, is this Mr. Gonzalez? I said, yes. They said, the same Mr. Gonzalez went and talked to the Giants and they won the Super Bowl? I said, yeah. <laughs> this time the voice gets angry and starts saying words I can't repeat up here in front of you. I said, whoa, why are you so angry? Who is this on the phone? He's like, well, I'm the head football coach of the high school you work at. You know, we could have been all in. We could have won some games too. I said, coach, I am so sorry. I didn't even know it was going to work. He said, well, we start preseason conditioning in a month. I better see you in the weight room with my guys. Talking to him. I said, sure, sure. And before I knew it, guys, it was crazy, but... The high school where I get the pleasure of teaching, Union City High School, decided they wanted to be, what are these two words? Oh, yeah. There we go, we're getting the hang of it. It was awesome, and I love being with my school and with my kids, but I think it's done. Two weeks later, another phone call. Mr. Gonzalez, yes, same one to talk to the Giants, yes. They said, actually, we're not a football team. I said, that's, that's okay, because All In has nothing to do with football. I said, all right. Well, we're a college located in the basement of the Empire State Building in New York City. I didn't even know there was a college in there, but I said, you know what, I'll show up Saturday. And before I realized it, once again, the King's College in the basement of the Empire State Building decided they need, wanted to be, help me out, guys. Oh, there we go. You guys are getting the hang of this. And it was amazing, and I loved working with the college, but I said, all right, now we're done. How many people ever got a call on your cell phone you don't recognize the number? Anyone ever have? Okay, we've been there. Wow, lots of cell phones. Awesome. <laughs> I start getting a ton of calls. I don't even recognize the area code. So just like you, I don't talk to strangers. I'm pressing ignore, go to voicemail, all that good stuff. Finally, one number calls me five times in one night, and the last time it's called me 1145. I finally pick up the phone, and I say, may I help you? The voice said, sorry to bother you, Mr. Gonzalez. We didn't account for the time difference. We heard you worked with a team. They became very successful. Um, could you come work with our team? I said, sure. Uh, just give me your address. I'll drive when I have the chance. They said, actually, Mr. Gonzalez, um, 
we're going to be in Chicago in about a week. We need you to meet us there. I said, Chicago. Well, I didn't realize it, but there's this team in the NBA. They're called the Portland Trailblazers. And it was amazing working with them. You know, LaMarcus Aldridge and Damian Little, all these great guys. But just to be honest, after I work with them, they don't even make the playoffs. So let's not talk about them, okay? <laughs> and then after working with them, I get this really weird area code number, like a lot of digits. And this weird accent comes on the phone and said, Mr. Gonzalez, we'd like to invite you to go over to London. I said, London? Oh, okay. And they said, we have this team over there. And it's a soccer team. They're called, they're called Arsenal. And they were, they were like a pretty big deal because they're into soccer. And it was an amazing experience. And then I get another phone call just this past summer. And they said, well, being you've went over there, would you mind going to Spain? And in Spain, they have this soccer team. Yeah. And, they, and this is a team called Barcelona. And they even made this jersey. And they said, will you help our team be all in? They're having a pretty good season, which is amazing. And like Messi is really that short. It's crazy. But he's amazingly talented. And then, then the government starts hearing about it. So they said, Mr. Gonzalez, could you talk to our Department of Transportation? And I said, sure. And they said, will you speak to our DMV? And I think the lines are like five minutes shorter. So I think they're all in too. And then I get a phone call from the FBI. And they don't really give t-shirts, but they gave me one of these. Hopefully, I'll never have to use it. But I don't know. I think it's pretty cool. And then corporations start hearing about it. And first, it was PNC Bank. And will you talk to our employees? And then it was you know, America Online, talk to us, and then I get a phone call. I said, Mr. Gonzalez, we have a private plane waiting. We'd love to take you down to Arkansas. And I said, no offense to anyone from Arkansas, but what could be in Arkansas? I didn't know it, but this is a company you may have heard of. They're called Walmart. And I fly down to Arkansas, and I speak, and they said, no, there's a shareholders meeting. This is actually a big deal. You're not just going to go to a store and talk to our cashiers. And as I'm sitting there, I'm very nervous, very nervous. And I'm sitting there waiting for my turn to go up and speak, and I hear this voice. But of course, I'm nervous. You know. You guys ever be are really nervous about something, and so you play on your cell phone, you act really busy, but really you're nervous? Okay, you know what it feels like. I was playing like doodle jump and stuff like that, and I'm sitting there, and the voice says, Mr. Gonzalez, I'm excited to hear your story. I look up, it's Tom Cruise. So I'm like, oh. So I go up to, I, I stand up to shake his hand. The funny thing, he's only about this tall too, so I felt better about myself, and there's other guys in the room. He walks over, he has this weird accent, and I shake his hand, and he's like, oh, I'm you, Jackman, mate, nice to meet you, and I was kind of nervous to shake his hand, because you know what, the whole Wolverine thing, but then this girl walks in, and now I'm really bad with sometimes like, you know, musical pop stars, and she walks in, she said, oh, Mr. Gonzalez, we're going to start, I'm going to sing the national anthem to start us off, and I was like, really, wow, I, you look really familiar, she's like, well, I'm Kelly Clarkson, it's nice to meet you too, and like I said, I'm just a ninth grade world history teacher, <laughs> but I have to say, the biggest honor, without a doubt, a lot of my students that I get the chance to work with, they love to play a video game, maybe you guys know of it, it's called Call of Duty, anyone know, okay, okay, you guys have heard of it, all right. Guys, it's one thing to play a video game. It's another thing entirely, getting the honor and the privilege to work with our armed forces. And first, with our, getting to speak with our National Guard and then our Air Force, and then with Under Armour's help, even our Navy SEALs. And they even made a shirt at the time, and it, on the back it said, all in, all the time. Because honestly, who better to represent being all in than our armed forces men and women who are all in for us every single day. And honestly, they always deserve a round of applause for what they do for it. Amazing what they do. Absolutely amazing. Beautiful. kind of hot under there, sorry. But you know, sometimes people just don't get it. I was in San Diego working with a corporation last summer, and I remember I finished speaking, and an individual walked up to me, and he said, uh, he said Mr. Gonzalez, pretty good talk. Thank you for helping inspire our company, but uh, I just want to be honest with you. Um, you're wasting your time. I said, oh, excuse me? He said, oh. I just want to let you know that, you know, you made a big mistake. See, this all-in thing is a, it's a great slogan. You know what a slogan is, right, Mr. Gonzalez? It's like Nike's Just Do It or McDonald's I'm Loving It, you know. Great slogan. It helps generate more profit. But the problem is you didn't copyright it. You're not getting any royalties off of it. It's a big mistake. I said, honestly, sir, it's, it's not a slogan for me. It's, something more. He said, well, I'm just letting you know what it is. I'm in charge. I'm the vice president of marketing. It is. Big mistake. Adidas is using it for the World Cup last summer, but you're getting nothing. That's where I stopped when I said, guys, for me, it's not a slogan. It's a lifestyle. It's something I choose to live every single day. He still didn't understand what I meant, so I said, you know what, sir? I have time for a quick story, and I really have to go. I told him about a young woman who was sitting in a doctor's office. 
Most of the time we're sitting in the doctor's office, we don't want to be there, but she's excited to be at the doctor's. Her name is called, she runs past the nurse into the examination room, sits up on the table and lays back. She's so excited to be at the doctor's because, because she's going to get to see her child. She's pregnant. And she lays back on the table and she begins to see the images on the screen and the heartbeat. She gets very emotional and the nurse, the doctor there, everything is beautiful except the doctor walks out of the room and the nurse follows. She doesn't care, she loves seeing her child, but the nurse comes in the room with a small card in her hand, hands it to the woman on the table and walks out. Now she's curious. She opens up the card and begins to read the following. It says, we're sorry to inform you, but you've contracted the measles. Nothing's wrong with getting the measles. You get some small bumps on your body, a fever, a flu, a couple of weeks, it's gone. But if you get the measles while you're pregnant, it can have very dangerous effects on the child inside. Also on the card, it said the doctor is sorry to inform that he cannot see certain limbs of the body developing. He's not sure if your child will have an arm or a leg. And simply on the bottom of the card, it said, it's in our expert opinion that you consider terminating this pregnancy and try again later with your husband at another time for another child. The woman is crushed. She went from being absolutely ecstatic to completely distraught in a matter of moments. <laughs> the nurse walks in and said, Miss, I know this is difficult. What would you choose to do? The woman sits up off the table and she says, thank you for your expert opinion. Thank you for your advice but I choose to be committed to this child, whether he lives for two more weeks or he lives for 20 years. I choose to be committed to him whether he has one arm or no arms, one leg or no legs. That's my choice. And honestly, guys, I'm so thankful for that woman because see, that woman was my mom and I was a child inside of her stomach that day. You see, that's what all it means to me. It's not a t-shirt. It's not a wristband. I'm excited to work with the team this year, but really, it's not even about them winning a the Super Bowl. See, what all it means to me is when you stick with something and other people tell you to quit. When you keep going, even though people tell you that you are wasting your time. Once again, I want to talk to my students in here. There's going to be times this season, if there haven't already been times in your sporting lives where other people have told you to quit. Maybe there's times that people say, why are you trying so hard in practice? You're not going to start anyway. Why are you trying? You're not going to even be able to play in high school. You're not even that good. You have a choice. See, the funny thing is you always have a choice. Whether you go all in or whether you step back and quit. It's your choice. But that's what all in means. And I know it's hard. I will not sugarcoat this and say it's easy. But I will challenge you tonight. See, I'm not going to say if that moment comes, I'm going to say when it comes. For you as parents, when it comes. See, the funny thing is everyone in this room has a different all in. It's different for each one of us. As I travel around the world and I have the privilege of speaking, people sometimes ask me what's mine. See, mine starts right here. Even though I come from a background in the city where most people don't know where the dad is, I made a promise that my children would know their father. Those are the two words I keep on the inside of my wedding ring. All in. Like I said, it's different for each one. See, the funny thing is when I talk to the Giants, people think I talked about football. Like I said, it had nothing to do with football. When I walked into that room, I asked them one question. I said, what does it mean to be committed? Some guy said this, some guy said that. So I said, all right, guys, I used to play a game. I don't have time to go into the story, but I used to play for the LA Clippers, and when we would fly to the different places before I signed the contract, we'd play a game on the plane called poker. So I asked the Giants in that room that night before Christmas Eve, I said, what does it mean if you push all your chips in the middle of the table? Justin Tuck was on the team at the time before we went to the Raiders, and he was sitting in the back, and I remember he said, well, that means you're all in. You're ready to win, you're done going halfway. I said, all right, well, what would happen if you push all your chips in the middle of the table, but then you pull them back and you tell everyone you were just kidding? Remember, Justin smiled and he said, that's how you get punched in the face. <laughs> I said, that's great. So if you're never doing a game, why do we do it with our lives? Why do we say we're going to be committed when things get tough? We say, that's not for me. So as you heard, I gave him a chip and I gave him a marker. I said, if you mean business, you take this chip and you sign it. Put it someplace you'll see it. And every time you see it, you let it remind you of the commitment you made. Not that you're going to be perfect, but are you really all in? Or are you just faking? Some guys took the chip they put in their locker to touch before they hit the field. But other guys, they took the chip and they said, this is going in the middle of my kitchen table. 
because I'm all in for the field, but I need to be all in for my families. Before I leave, I brought a present for you guys tonight, if it's okay. And you can get this at the end when you're taking selfies with Evan, because Evan is amazing. There's chips and there's markers. If you mean business, you take a chip before you leave and you sign it. You put it someplace you're going to see it. I don't know what your all-in is, but when you see it every single day, you let it remind you. Am I giving everything I have? Even if I only have 10 minutes to give, am I really giving everything I have? Or am I going halfway? I want to challenge you guys tonight, students and parents. What if we made it more than just a slogan? What if all of us made it a lifestyle? I personally think that's a story everybody would be telling. God bless you guys. Thank you for your time tonight. But I want to finish with a few statements to each group in particular. Um, let me say first to the coaches. The thing to remember as a coach is that you will coach your kids on a team the way you would want your child to be coached by somebody else. That's the most important thing to remember, and especially on a youth league. You know, people tell me they play for the fifth grade championship, and I'm saying, what are we playing for championships in the fifth grade? They should just be playing and having fun. There's no coach that I know who has on their tombstone won the fifth grade travel championship. But we get so into it, that we forget that. It's supposed to be fun. Everybody's supposed to play. Whether you win or lose, people don't care. It's whether or not they enjoy playing. Now, that doesn't mean you don't teach them to compete. You do them a disservice by not teaching them to compete. But please remember, this is somebody else's kid who is entrusted with them to you. To the parents, I would say this. I wrote 40% of my book directly to parents, and there are very specific guidelines to make your trip a little easier. The simplest things to remember are this. It's not about you. It's not a reflection of you. As Yogi would say, we had our turn. Now it's their turn. Evan's father let him be who he wanted to be, not who his father wanted him to be. They're ours, but our job is just to support them and encourage them, encourage their effort. We don't have to praise the results. We can't control the outcome. Now, that doesn't mean you praise everything. Boy, Jordan, you're such a good breather. We're not talking about overpraising. We're praising the effort, not the outcome. We give money for kids who get A's on a report card. I see bumper stickers, proud parent of an honor student. What happens next semester when they don't make the honor roll? We're not proud anymore? Let's just get bumper stickers that say proud parent. And let's empower them instead of enabling them. If they have issues with their teachers or their coaches, tell them how to approach it with their coach. Don't tell their coach. I tell you, I teach a coaching class at Montclair State, and I give seminars all the time. It's such a hard job. It's such a hard job. I know sports parenting, it's like temporary insanity. I get it. I get it. The best thing to do Root for the whole team, not just your kid. Root for the whole team, not just your kid. When the game is over, just say, boy, I really love watching you play. Nobody is making the NFL or the Major League Lacrosse League by their performance in the fifth grade. To you youngsters, I would say what John Paul said. When I was at Montclair State, we had one rule. If you wanted to play at Montclair State, you followed one rule. And as a parent, I've always had this rule with my daughter. 
because I believe that this is the rule that determines whether people are successful in life or not. And that is, if you want to be successful, you need to learn to be in the right place at the right time and do the right thing. We don't need 8,000 rules. Kids know where they're supposed to be and when they're supposed to be there. If you're not sure if it's the right thing, just pretend that your grandmother's standing next to you. You'll know. What would your grandmother think if somebody was asking you to do something or telling you to do something that you knew was inappropriate? That's the only rule that we need. You know, we give a test. We say that an athlete takes a test, and in our sports psychology class, we call it the pillow test. And I think it's a good test. I'll do it tonight. I do it most of the times when I give a talk or if I have a class. And before I put my head on the pillow, I'll say to myself, am I glad I did or do I wish I had? Very simple. Am I glad I did or do I wish I had? We take that pillow test every night. But for you youngsters, I would get a copy of this if I could. Put it in your locker, put it in your briefcase, put it in your backpack, put it in your room. It's a titled The Guy in the Glass, and I suggest that you read it all of the time. There are going to be a lot of young people who are asking you and telling you to do certain things. You have to make decisions on your own about what is best. I'm going to be 67. I have probably more friends now than I've ever had in my life. And none of them are people I went to grade school with. Do you understand that? I'm so glad that I didn't let those young people, and I was a street kid from Orange, New Jersey. I'm so glad that I didn't let those kids talk me into doing things that I knew I shouldn't be doing. When you get what you want in your struggle for self, and the world makes you king for a day, then go to the mirror and look at yourself and see what that guy has to say. For is isn't your father, it isn't your mother, who judgment upon you must pass, the fellow whose verdict counts most in your life is the one staring back from the glass. He's the fellow to please, never mind all the rest, for he's with you clear up to the end, and you've passed your most dangerous, most difficult test if the guy in the glass is your friend. You may be like Jack Horner and chisel a plum and think you're a wonderful guy, but the man in the glass thinks you're only a bum if you can't look him square in the eye. You can fool the whole world down the pathway of years and get pats on the back as you pass. But your final reward will be heartache and tears if you cheated the guy in the glass. Thank you for coming out. Hopefully you will have a great season. And more importantly, hopefully you will do sports the right way so that we can all continue to enjoy them. Thanks, Tom.